Hey people, welcome to Roll20Con, two days of gaming for charity. We're going to be playing a whole bunch of games the next few days, including Kids on Bikes, Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and even a game creator panel. In preparation for a special announcement happening this weekend, we designed this cool shirt, all sales benefit take this.org, and you can pick that up now on Teespring, but you got to hurry. It'll only be available until October 18th. Speaking of celebration, we've also decided to unlock dynamic lighting on the site. So if you've always wanted to try out dynamic lighting, tag your game with Roll20Con, and that feature will be unlocked for you. We also have an exclusive art pack that some of our favorite creators put together. That's available on our marketplace with a donation to take this. Up next, we have a game creator panel hosted by James Intracasso with Alex Roberts, Brandon Dixon, and Jim McClure. Hey, everybody, how is it going? Welcome to the Game Creator Panel for Roll20Con. It's super exciting to be here. I am with some of the industry giants, I would say, uh, who are creating the games of the future and some of your favorite games that you're playing currently. Uh, so why don't we quickly go around the table, uh, let us know who you are, what you're working on, what you've made in the past, what people might know you from. Uh, Alex, why don't we start with you? Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Alex Roberts. Uh, you've probably heard me on the Backstory podcast that recently wrapped up. Um, that was on the One Shot Podcast Network. Um, you may have also played Starcrossed, my two-player game of Forbidden Love, or For the Queen, uh, my card-based storytelling game about also love <laughs> and <laughs> duty and honor and betrayal. Um, and uh, yeah, I make games. I talk on panels like this. I, uh, I write about games. I, I talk a lot about games and romance, and I love encouraging people to make their own stuff. So yeah, we'll talk about all that. Excellent. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you here. Um, I am a big fan of yours uh, and the work that you have done. Uh, and I am going to throw it now to Jim McClure, who, Jim, before you start, can you tell us what award Alex has won? <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh. Oh no. Oh no, we lost Jim. We muted. We muted <laughs> yourself, Jim. Bud. Jim, I don't know what happened to your audio, but uh this is uh we, we have lost you all of a sudden here. Um so close. So close. We were so close. Uh so <laughs> let me I'll give you a minute to figure that out. Um but uh for those who don't know, no. uh Jim. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, yes, hey. I can. Sorry, you were telling okay. us about Alex's award. Yes, and then and then our, our wonderful Zoom decided to switch microphones to a non-existent one. So yes, I'm sorry. Uh, no, so uh, re 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 rewind. Uh, yes, uh, Starcrossed. You're going to sell it short. The the Diana Jones Award-winning Starcrossed from this year, <laughs> uh, which is of course is a, a brilliant game, and I, I will just be sitting here singing Alex's praises for the night. Um, but like uh, yes, hello everyone. Uh, now that you can hear me, uh, my name is Jim McClure. Uh, I'm in in the indie rpg game designer and publisher uh i'm owner and lead designer for third act publishing uh as well as i do a fair amount of design work with roll 20 who's hosting this wonderful panel alongside a uh, mr james intercasso and of course uh, roll 20's first game that it's designed burn bright that will be coming out shortly uh i also talk into the microphone on a lot of different shows as well as my own podcast also on the one shot podcast network called talking tabletop which comes out periodically uh and yeah i just sort of really like like RPGs and game design and game design theory and talking about it. So I think we're going to have a, a wonderful conversation here today. Absolutely. Absolutely. And finally, Brandon, who are you and what do you do in this wonderful game creation world as well as uh, in other fields, if you want to talk about that, because you, you've kind yeah. of created uh, a whole setting that a lot of stuff happens in. Yeah. So uh, my name is Brandon, Brandon Dixon. Uh, you may know me from something called Swordsfall, which I'm working on. And uh, basically it's a setting and that's always the thing I like to remind people because yeah, it has an RPG, but I consider myself the creator, the writer. So um, as of right now, we've kickstarted a setting and art book. And then basically that's gonna like tell you about the whole world. And then we also launched, uh, we kickstarted our graphic novel, 
and that's gonna be super cool along with like some tarot cards and then i myself i'm a writer so i write basically all the stuff for swords fall and i also write my own like short stories and i'm writing like a novel in that world and basically it's an afropunk sci fantasy yeah. and i'm just trying to do something cool and new but also take stuff that's already been done and then remix it and make it cooler so yes that's what i do Yes, absolutely, which is a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and I should introduce myself. I am James Intricasso. Uh I work with Jim uh, on stuff for Roll20, uh, including Burn Bright, uh, which we are super excited about. Um, I also do design work with Wizards of the Coast, Cobalt Press, uh, City of Mist, a bunch of other things. Um, so uh, it's super awesome to be here uh, with these people. Uh, now, before we get started, uh, I do want to let the people who are currently watching watching uh, know that currently there is a t-shirt and art pack that are part of Roll20 that benefit takethis.org. Um, there are two shirts. In fact, I'm going to show them off right now. Here we go. Oh, here it is uh, on a body in a street. Um, you can mm -hmm. see it there. Uh, the shirt was inspired by Call of Cthulhu, and this year's theme is Things Are Not What They Seem. It's $20 and available on Teespring. Here it is on a hanger. Whoa, look at that! Hangs nice too. Um, so you can get your roll, you can get your roll twenty con twenty nineteen shirt and support mental health education and awareness in the gaming community. All t shirt sales benefit uh, take this, so you can look and feel good. That's pretty great. Um, and a little bit about take this. Uh, take this is working towards a game community that welcomes and supports people experiencing mental health challenges, and that that recognizes the humanity and mental health of game creators, something that we'll probably be talking about a little bit here today. Um, so you can support the organization now and get a free art pack from the Roll20 Place Market Creators with a donation. So you get cool art for your games, you can go get a cool t-shirt, and you can feel great about doing it because you're supporting TakeThis.org. So thank you very much for setting that up. Thank you to all the people at Roll20, especially our uh, hidden hero, Carlos, over here. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, setting everything up and uh, making Roll20Con a smash hit. Now, uh, I have some questions for these creators, and we're going to be going around and talking, but you in the chat might have questions. So if you do, type QUESTION in big capital letters so that I'll see it in the chat, and I will make sure that we ask our creators that. So, games. How do we make them, right? That's what this panel is kind of about. So I figured we would start at the very beginning, and we can kind of go through the process a little bit. Let's start with games. Like, how do you get an idea for a game and how do you know that it's a an original game that you want to create versus something that maybe you want to take and you know hack fate or uh, the powered by the apocalypse system how do you know this is a game that needs to be a wholly original game um and alex if it's cool i'd love to start with you <laughs> <laughs> sure um i think uh talking about whether something is a hack or whether it's a new thing it's okay to not know right away um, Starcrossed started many years before I started doing any kind of playtesting um, when I played Dread, which is the, the Jenga-based horror role-playing game that I very, very much love, um, still really enjoy, great game. Um, but when I played it, I thought, man, you know, it's really scary having a crush on someone. That's the scariest thing I can think of. So I thought, you know, at some point, someone should make uh, a playset for Dread that's just about having a crush on someone. Um, and this was many years ago before I knew that you really can't rely on anyone else to make a game for you. You actually you have an <laughs> idea, you have to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, unless I suppose you're very wealthy or you're Wendy's or something, and then you don't have to do any work mm -hmm. and you can just reach out <laughs> um, But anyway, so I had this idea for what I thought would be a playset, And it wasn't until I really sat down with the idea and tried to work on it that it became very, very obvious that just hacking um, wasn't going to be enough. Um, it wasn't there. So I, I think it's okay to not have any idea where you're going to end up when you start working on something. It's okay to just, you know, if you think of like a sculpture, I think it's actually okay to just start chipping away at it and kind of see what comes out. Totally. Yeah. I, you know, I think, um, 
and I, I hate to steal Jim's line here, but role-playing games are a form of art, right? And so if you approach the creative <laughs> process that way, that's a, a good way to think about it. Um, so Jim, since I've stolen from you, I'll now throw it over to you. Uh, how do you uh, get started? How do you get inspired uh, to make a game? Well, so now I have two things that I have to say before I even answer the question, which is just absurd. And, and just to, to make myself the worst panelist possible for you. Uh, one being uh, tabletop RPGs, I have to correct you, sir, as you steal my quote, are not a form of art. They are the highest form of art known to mankind, which I, I firmly believe because tabletop RPGs, ah, that's where it's at. Uh, the other thing, just and this is just a random bit of shade to throw out for no reason, but because Alex uh, referenced the the wonderful Wendy's RPG that came out two days ago, oh boy. Uh, I looked through that, um, and you know the only thing I should say the only thing without getting getting too too deep into it, the thing that bothered me about that, if you look through that book, no one is credited. Other than the illustrator, uh, the illustrator, I think there's one other either concept art or something like that. And that really bothered me as a designer, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about games. Uh, and Jim started his his wonderful answer by throwing shade at two different things. So, haha, <laughs> welcome to Jim McClure panel. Uh, but uh, we're, we're talking about games and, and sort of uh, where you get ideas and how to start for it. Um, and, uh, you know, this is going to uh, sort of come from, you know, a, a personal place of, of for, for me. Um, which is, as I sort of stated in the introduction, you know, what I get really into and what I get really excited about uh, is, is game designs and making new systems. Jim McClure, that's what gets him out of bed in the morning is to go, how can I make a mechanical system that will encourage players to experience this emotion? That is essentially the core of what I go for. Uh, and when I essentially make a game, it's because I had an idea that popped into my head that goes, oh, I want this thing. I want Shadow of Colossus, the RPG. And then I look and I go, oh, does that exist anywhere? And I always hope the answer is yes, because if the answer is no, then darn it, I'm going to have to make the thing, <laughs> uh, which is shockingly a lot more work than, than buying a PDF online and having it. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, so I look for it. And and so, like, uh, you know, the latest game that I went to Kickstarter with, Reach of Titan, was exactly that. It was, uh, you know, Shadow of Colossus, sort of the, the tabletop RPG. Uh, and for those who don't know what Shadow of Colossus is, it was a very, very well-received video game from 10, 15 years ago now about fighting giant larger-than-life creatures. Um, so what, what really gets me into a game is I go, okay, does this game exist anywhere? Is there a system that captures uh, what this game does and if the answer is no to both of those questions then for me that's when when i get all of the tinglys of excitement i go okay how do i get the feel of a bunch of people climbing around this giant what is ultimately a puzzle and solving the puzzle while being thrown off of it and getting back on and it exists in this weird mythical realm of like we only really have like little metal swords and all of that yet we're finding giant creatures yet part of the combat is we're just going to fall 200 feet to the ground and get back up and keep fighting and what does that look like and how do we achieve those things uh, so that's that's that long, complicated answer is sort of Jim McClure's process of it goes idea. Does it exist? Is there a system that can capture it? And if the answer is no to those things, then then Jim puts his designer hat on and goes, all right, let's uh, let, let's make a game. Mm, gotcha. Gotcha. That is a uh, I, I love that the like, hey, uh, you know, go check to see if something that you have is there. I often will fire off a tweet that's like, hey, ah, I have this idea for this thing. And people will be like, have you seen Feng Shui? Have you seen this? And it's like, ah, OK. All right. <laughs> it's out there, which is uh, some ways relieving because we're going to talk about the amount of work game design takes, too. But first, Brandon, I want to hear from you, too, um, because I've heard you answer this question before. Uh, how do you get get uh, ideas for games and and you know how did you decide uh, swords fall needed to be a role-playing game so for me I always start with the idea like for me usually what happens is like I'm, I'm a big like media guy so I watch a lot of movies a lot of shows I play a lot of games and I'll see something cool and and I know this happens to a lot of people and I'm like like for instance um probably the most recently I was playing the game Path of Exile, right? One of my favorite games, free to play, kind of like Diablo 2, and it's very, uh, very free form. So when I play it, it just kind of gets the wheels turning in the back of my head because I'm thinking, oh, this is a little cool, and this is a little cool. And I was playing this random um, build and it had this one skill called Mirage Archer. And all it did was it had this little shadow element over you that did the same action you did. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, I was like, man, how cool would it be to have spirits that do that? And in my world, I'd already decided like spirits would be a thing because when I started Swords Fall, I wanted to be related to African lore and not just in terms of, I didn't want to just take a wholesale story. I wanted to take the essence of it because I'm a philosophy guy. So I wanted to take like, you know, what's the story trying to tell you, you know, and then take the soul of that and then basically have it still be in that biodome, you know, so you get that feel of Africa without necessarily being like, this is Africa and clubbing you over the head with it. So I'm always taking little extra ideas and thinking, oh, this would be cool. And this is how we do it right now. But if I take it apart and then put it into the sauce of what I'm working with, what does that look like? So I thought to myself, like, what would it look like to have some sort of class with the spirit archer? Like, and then just think to myself, like, hmm, like, well, spirits is already a thing. Maybe it's their ancestors. Oh, well, how cool would it be to be like a trained archer and you get to call on like the spirit of like one of the top archers in the past, you know? And then that became one of the classes, which is called Dead Quiver in my game. And that's always how I take stuff. So I deconstruct it, you know? So instead of just taking the whole idea and copying it as is, I take the essence of it. And then it makes it easier to either craft it into what I want to do or change it into something new. Like if I wanted to take that as a hack, you know, it was really easy to be like, okay, well, what's the game we're having the most fun with? Or what's a game that actually has already a component that I could do a spirit with? And then maybe I would do that. But for me, I like to do original content. So I'm always like, cool, how can I take that and put it in my own thing? You know, I always imagine it like, I call it swords fall sauce because I like <laughs> food analogies. I use tacos a lot for analogies, but I think of it like a sauce, you know, because it's, uh, you know, you're taking different spices and you're going add a little of this and add a little of that. And once you've done that enough, even if you started off making spaghetti or chili, you start adding your own little taste to it and now it's yours, you know? So you can say it's the same thing. I can say that, oh, this is a Afropunk sci fantasy RPG. You can kind of get a sense of what that is, but I still get to define what that is. You know, I still get to say what that looks like. I get to tell you what my tastes are. I get to tell you what spices I used. And, you know, maybe you're like, oh man, I love paprika. That's awesome. I'm glad someone did that. You know, and, and games are the same way. That's why we like little pieces. You know, maybe we don't like that the game does X, but it has enough other stuff. We're like, ah, it's okay. I can pick that out. Mm-hmm. And, and and it's the same way. When I think of design, I was thinking about it like that. So make your own sauce and then dip everything in it. Yeah. That's my TLD. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Games are like a buffet, right? Um, you know, yes. and I, I like that idea too of staying true to the essence or the core of a game, right? Like, hey, there, there's this big idea and then there are all these really fun bits that we put on because we like it and we say, this is amazing and this is cool, but we're trying to stay core, uh, true to whatever like a core concept is, um, which, you know, I think, Alex, to your point, we don't always know necessarily. We, we have an, a, like a big idea, but we don't necessarily know core mechanically how we're going to get there or that kind of thing. Um, how do you uh, take your first step, Alex? Like, w- So once you have your idea and you think, okay, I'm going to make a game now or I'm going to make something that I think will be a game, um, like where do you do you do you play something? Do you read a lot of stuff? Do you, you uh, do you go on a bunch of dates to see how it works <laughs> until you fall in love? Like, uh, w- what was your process like for Starcrossed, for instance? Well, so I, I, I definitely am not someone who has a set process, like mm-hmm. idea, then this, then that, then whatever. And um, I would be very wary of anyone who tells you that this is the process or this is what you should do. Um, because I, I use design sometimes, but I actually, uh, I don't really like design, like thinking about it in terms of that. I don't like necessarily thinking about, okay, what's my design goal and how can I iterate to like better accomplish that goal? Um, because I like the idea of game making to surprise me. And I like the idea of finding out things about myself, uh, through making games. And I've found lots of things that I didn't, didn't want to find (laughs) in there. Um, and that's, and I think that's wonderful and that's amazing. And, um, and you know, I, I like getting, when I can get more invested in the process of making something than in the result, um, I think I benefit a lot more, um, whether or not the end product benefits from that, I don't care. Um, yeah. So you know, where I started with Starcrossed, which was okay. 
play a bunch of dread and then write down a bunch of stuff on cue cards like like literally just like start writing ideas and then like throwing them all over the table and then seeing how I can connect them tearing some up and throwing them behind me writing out a bunch um that's why to this day the um the game has scene cards that have each scene kind of quickly described because that was me writing stuff on cue cards and just and just going with it um you know as we're for the queen i started that whole thing in a google doc and immediately started inviting people to it and saying hey I, am i doing anything here does this make any sense and we didn't really get into into physical prototyping for a little bit after that um and then something like pop so i'm, I'm working on this game about people who love balloons <laughs> and so i i mean i was looking up lunars and like people who really really love balloons mm -hmm. um for years, like probably for a decade before I did anything, did anything with it. Sure. But at the same time, that game couldn't exist without those years and years of like following forums and like seeing what they're up to and following people on Twitter and um, and all of that like research. Um, and and then once that started to really become a thing, I was kind of using paper that was in my immediate environment and letting that guide design. So like, I don't know, I really, I really have no process whatsoever. Like it's really, <laughs> I think I would get bored and I wouldn't want to keep making games if I made them the same way every time. <laughs> That's valid though. I mean, you do have to switch it up. I mean, that that is the thing that I think that sometimes we don't talk about. Like, cause I don't know about you, Alex, but for me, like, I might have two or three different things that I have open, but I have like one that's my actual thing. The other two, that's like my, gotta get the idea out of my head and just kind of have like a breather. You know? Yes. Yeah, totally. Someone, I'm trying to remember who it was. Someone gave me this amazing piece of advice, which was always have three things on the go, have something that is almost done. So you can just kind of pick away at it and do the, you know, little finishing touches, have something that is like right in the throes of really interesting kind of shaping it together and then have something that is still just an idea and that you can play with and it, you haven't seen any of its faults yet, so you can still be in love with it. Mm -hmm. And you can just think about it in the shower and not really accomplish anything. Because all of all of those three places kind of feed you in different ways. Um, and so if you run out of editing energy, you can go back to idea energy. If you run out of ideating energy, you can go into like um, iterating energy or, wh or whatever, right? Like I think, I, I think working on any one thing in the exact same way for too long will probably drive you nuts or or burn you out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What usually happens for me is like I get really obsessed with an idea mm -hmm. and I can't get it out of my head. <laughs> and if I don't get it down on paper, then it starts becoming like destructive. It starts distracting me from what I want to do because I keep thinking, man, that idea just sounds really cool and I could do this. And sometimes I just have to get it on paper or start it. And then I go, oh, yeah, I just had this paragraph. That was that was all I had. <laughs> and then you're good. Like you got it out your system. Like I'm gonna go back to what I was really working on. You know. Do, do Jim or Brandon or or it's, do you ever like find a text file on your computer or like a note in your notes app where you're like, was this a game idea I had? Because it's it's nothing. Like it's literally nothing. But uh, it was obviously important. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> I've got a, a, a story about that because I, I keep a, a, a running, actually, I, I have two different uh, Google logs, uh, which is one is my like, okay, here's my idea for a game. And then here is my idea for a mechanics. As I said, I'm, I'm a mechanics heavy guy. Um, and so anytime I have an idea for e either of those, uh, it just, again, it just gets dropped in there for something later. And I was recently browsing through that. Uh, and all of a sudden I just see, poisoned potato and i was sitting there looking at that for 15 minutes and it's in my games idea not my mechanics idea i was like what are you why are you there because i can't no memory of ever typing those words or what this glorious but man there's a poison potato rpg apparently out there in the world somewhere to be made sinister spuds <laughs> 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 that's it that's, that's it. Was for me or like for me it's like uh because i love apps and then like i forgot that i used to love i uh, used to use everspace until i abandoned it and then it was like hey don't forget your everspace and i, I opened it up and i was like oh i write oh this was a hmm and i was like oh, i did it to myself again so then i had i dumped them all into my google docs <laughs> i 
So I fully pitched a game. I was, um, I, I spent some time in the hospital a while ago and while I was on crazy painkillers, um, I fully like wrote out a pitch and submitted it to an anthology and then completely forgot about it. And then while not on painkillers, just like, I was like, what is this? I was like, what is this doing here? What is this draft? And I opened it up, I'm like, oh God, I fully pitched that entire game. <laughs> this I mean, it'd be pretty cool if they accepted it, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, and it's true, right? All, all sorts of things, they come from all different places. Like I remember, so Burn Bright, uh, which Jim and I were working on, um, there was this idea of like, well, we want to do a science fiction, science fantasy type thing. Um, what can you do? And Jim and I talking about how like, oh, it was going to be really hard to create a universe that was big and expansive. And, you know, what if there was just one galaxy? And what if that galaxy was shrinking? And like, it all came from the fact that we were lazy. Uh, this idea of like <laughs> a shrinking galaxy. And that's the core part of the game. That's the core story of the game um, came from that. So yeah, the the process, I think you're right, Alex, is, is always different, um, you know, and there is no one path to like, this is how you make a game, right? Um, and so time, I think, is a big factor. Giving yourself the time to explore, giving yourself the time to play test and, and do all of those things, I think, is, uh, is huge. Uh, where do you find that it is valuable to spend your time, Brandon? Like, how do you, you want to spend your time when you are designing a game? It's actually good because I, I saw someone comment and I actually wanted to answer because they mentioned like, oh, like you get an idea out of your head, it's just and grow and grow. And I think that goes along with time. Mm -hmm. It's it's this weird catch-22. If you have a creative brain, at some point it runs you, you don't run it. And just because you're working on X doesn't mean it's not thinking about Y, Z, A, B squared to the second power over here. and you either have to learn to distance yourself from that to either be like, okay, I know I want to think about X, but I have to focus. And you have to be willing to sacrifice those ideas. And I think that's sometimes something that creators have a hard time with. We feel like we got it. We got to catch them all, you know, got to keep them all. <laughs> yeah. And if you are working on a certain project, especially if it's for money, your livelihood, then it has to be the focus. And you do have to accept that other ideas may fall away, they may die, they may not go anywhere. It, it's a weird acceptance you have to have because that is that is the quantifications. You only have X amount of time in the day and that's just the truth. So you have to decide what do you want to spend doing it. Mm -hmm. With that said, there are some ideas that seem to run away with you. Mm -hmm. And that's when I say you either, and that's when I say like you have those other things. So sometimes there'll be a night where I go, okay, I gotta get this idea out of my head. And I will go sit down and write that out. I'll spend that day that I'm in my evening and I just dump it out. I just brain dump it. And either I find myself to the end of the idea to the point where I'd have to actually focus on it and then I, I know I'm good or I find I run out or I find there's more there. And once again, you got to look at it. Are you, do you have a project that has to be finished on a deadline or for money? Then once again, you have to be like, okay, honestly, you have to work on A. But if you're still in the creative process or you don't have a deadline, then sometimes you realize that your second idea was the better idea. You know, sometimes the original idea you thought was gold actually helped you realize the limitations and the second idea comes from that. You know, and that's the weird thing about creativity. So you just kind of have to, or especially for me, since I have multiple projects, I definitely prioritize what I have. So I go, okay, no matter what, Welcome to Tycor is is my thing. And once I pretty much had that finished, which all my writing for that is done, I get to go, cool, what are my other things I want to do? And I just prioritize. Mm -hmm. And then I have like, I have, I actually have like a 40 page doc of just nothing but random notes and ideas of stuff that I'd like to do. Will I get to it? Maybe. Sometimes it's good to pillage. There's plenty of times where I'm working on my main project and I have no ideas. Why go to someone else when I can just pillage for myself? So I go through stuff that I didn't make or stuff that I didn't like, you know, and sometimes you're surprised. Sometimes you go back to something you hated six months ago and go, well, I see what I was trying to say. Maybe if I take this piece out or that, and it's just, uh, 
there's like a weird free form to it and you just gonna have to remember like your guidelines and that's always for me i have a big calendar that i set like little mock dates mm -hmm. and like every month i'll fail x amount <laughs> <laughs> there's a good five or six that just didn't you know and that's okay because i set unrealistic goals sometimes just so i get the feeling of that crunch because sometimes some ideas come from going okay i want to get this done today mm -hmm. and then your brain power goes up you know or you go oh i don't want to it's it's just uh it flows you know yeah. and i feel like that's the secret sauce is like no one's really that strict you say it to yourself as like an ethos and then you just keep your priority straight mm -hmm. and make docs like a lot of people i know will throw out ideas and i'm like why delete anything i don't delete anything Any <laughs> whether i hate it or i don't i keep it you know because sometimes you have to remember you already have that idea and you decided you weren't going to use it like mm -hmm. you can have the same idea again and be like oh that was a bad idea oh didn't i have that before i didn't write it down because it was a bad idea mm -hmm. like so i do have some stuff that it's like that won't work just so i can see it and i go oh yeah we said no to this and that That's helps fine. too you know yeah uh, Br Brandon, if you're looking for stuff to pillage, I'd, I'd be happy to send you poison potato. Like <laughs> put that on yours and let, let me know how that one turns out. Uh, I could come up with stuff on the spot. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, technically, if we want to get like nerdy, that is a human trait. Mm -hmm. Like raw potatoes is poisonous to most creatures. Right. So technically, if you have a fantasy world where they don't have the chromosome to actually digest it, potatoes do become poisonous. Wow just saying there you go and that's so that, the, uh, oh go ahead jim well now we're designing a game here on the panel because <laughs> that, 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 then it becomes okay if, if potatoes are poisonous to people to make it the interesting game hook why do then in our fictional game world people need potatoes because then there has to be that reason of like okay we have to have them yet they're poisonous to us which then has wonderful allegories into uh the, the rest of life and and now there's a hook and now poison potato becomes a little bit longer of a sentence i mean you could always do it like the scientific vampirism where it's like they crave blood because they need like x you know things from it so like you need starches and potassium but you can't eat potatoes but we need to figure it out i don't know mm -hmm. I did we just make stuff. the potato vampire rpg is that oh. what just started here <laughs> i think it is oh my gosh <laughs> coming to kickstarter yeah. 2021 potato vampires all right i'm on this i mean it is true to to write down everything and it used to be like i you know, as a millennial growing up, right, you didn't have smartphones. And so people would say to you, like, oh, carry a notebook around, carry it. But now mm -hmm. that was a hard thing to do. Um, but now you have a notebook at all times, right? You, your phone is on you. Um, the other day I was shouting, like, about mech warriors falling in love from the mm. shower to Siri to record these ideas down so I didn't forget them, right? So you've got that, um, you've got the capacity to to do that to to write down all of your ideas and they then they go up to a cloud and they sync with all your stuff and um so we're we're living in a great age and that's only going to become easier and easier to do um so definitely i agree with that write everything down uh jim you know you and i have worked together uh you like you said you you are a big mechanics guy you get inspired by mechanics to do uh, different things. Uh, when you're working on something, um, do you have a, a particular process or, or non-process that you like to go about things doing? Uh, I, I do. Um, and I want to I want to preface this with um, with sort of seconding something that Alex said at the start of this sort of conversation thread, which is everyone is going to have a, a different process, lack of process, non-structured process, whatever you want to call it, that's going to work for them. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my process is much more regimented than the other, the other panelists and it works for me, but I'm not by any means just want to say that that's going to work better for one person or another. Uh, but I just want to say that out outright because my, my process for design is, you know, it, it starts again, once we have that seed of an idea, okay, here's the, here's the thing that can't get out of my head. Here's, here's. Here's now poison potato, and we have to design poison potato. So, you know, how my, my process from there starts is I go, what is the core feeling I want this game to get across? 
And now how can I design a core mechanic that gets that feeling across is how Jim goes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know yet what, what the poison potato vampire core feeling is, but I do like this idea of needing something that is poisonous for you. That's a cool idea. Now we have something. So mechanically, I need to make a core mechanic with this game that makes you want a thing and make that thing bad for you. So how do you make a mechanic that goes, I need to touch and have the thing, but touching and have the thing hurt me uh and how does that play and honestly i think there's a lot better places than potato vampires to explore that particular design no. space um, i'm sold but, i'm sold on this i'm sold on this jim yeah, it, taters it, 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 <laughs> Wait, traitor tots right uh so what what i do from then is is i essentially try and establish a a core gameplay loop again i'm very mechanical focused uh but my gameplay loop is based around again establishing these these feelings and uh you know and and, and what i want the players to feel and experience while playing the game um and so what i do is i typically have a a one of my my design marathon sessions where I sit down in front of my my dining room table and I have note cards everywhere and I start writing, okay, here is the idea. And that gets slapped down in the middle of the table. What do I need to do to establish that idea? And I literally build out my note card circle and through lines. And I look like one of the crazy conspiracy theories with like lines going on walls from pieces of evidence. And I go, okay, after eight, nine hours of this, I think I have something that's playable. And then I immediately take that to my play group. I mean, like that week with nothing really typed or written. And I go, let's see if this does a thing. Mm -hmm. And then we play it. And sometimes it does. And sometimes it doesn't. And a lot of times it doesn't. Um, but that is sort of then the first steps in the process. Uh, and at that, throughout that whole period of time, I am in a very, very creative energy high. And it carries me through that first sort of stage of the process. Uh, but for me personally, then at some point, once it's like, okay, I actually i know the moment with every game it is a okay i know what this game now looks like i know theme i know setting i know mechanics i have that established then all of a sudden creative energy that creative input all around me is gone and now it's i have to type out 10,000 words 100,000 words whatever the length of the game is i promise i'll never do a 100,000 word game again until inspiration hits <laughs> um but and then it becomes work and for me personally because i'm so addicted to that creative energy coming in i can't allow myself to work or think about another project because then i'll never do the work part of typing so i have to 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 sequester myself and go okay i have to finish every word that needs to be written on this thing before i allow myself to think about the next idea that's creeping in uh because and and actually i love the comment that, that alex made of like if someone works on a, you know just one game and one project it'll probably drive them insane and i think she's right um because i don't know if i'd put myself on the category of sane uh but that is is the process you know that is that is jim's individual process that works for jim mcclure uh you know obviously your results may vary and it's part of why we we have these panels so you can hear and get different ideas for how different people approach these type things. Mm -hmm. Well, that sort of brings me to our first question from the viewers. Uh, <laughs> Lil Red Alchemist wants to know, how does one fight back the madness as they make games because they find themselves spiraling into the minutia of things, uh, which I think is an easy thing to do. You're, you're working on a game and you think, oh, I, I got to get detailed here. Or I got to get detailed here. Sometimes I find myself... Um, especially when I'm working on a, a, you know, like a supplement or an adventure for an existing game system that I'm like, oh, I'm over designing this because I'm thinking about that one super technical person at my table who is going to, you know, d dive into this and I don't really need to over design. Uh, that's a problem. But then the other problem is, you know, getting hyper focused on the details and forgetting sort of the, the overallness of the game. Um, you know, uh, how do we, how do we do that? Alex, uh, you know, how do you make sure you're not getting caught up in the minutia or is it okay to get caught up in the minutia? Um, I, I would, I would maybe just ask yourself about like, am I getting anywhere? Am I, am, am I accomplishing anything? Because maybe there is some very, very detail oriented work that you have to do on this particular part and it just kind of has to get done. It's not very fun, but, um, but when you're still making progress, it sounds to me like you're talking about getting stuck or feeling stuck or knowing that, okay, I've been writing a lot, but I don't think this is actually about anything or I don't think this is really relevant or I'm, I'm kind of chasing a, 
a weird eventuality that might never come up at the table. I think that's different. And I think like I would, I would go for, for a, a walk or a, a roll in the woods, like truly, like I would just like leave my computer. Um, I like to leave my computer as much as humanly possible. I like to do as much on paper or with cardboard or, or just like writing stuff out, like on whatever. Um, because I think you're, what it sounds to me like you're describing is just that like loss of energy and that loss of motivation and the feeling that I'm, I'm kind, I'm doing something kind of, but I can know, I know that it's not important. And so it, it might be good to just ask yourself or remind yourself, okay, what is my game about? Is what I'm doing right now about that? If not, maybe just let it go. Um, but even that you really might just need to like have a cup of tea, think about something else, take a nap. Um, I think really, I think the the advice for that situation is probably not game specific. I would probably just go hang out and do something unrelated. Cool. Yes, I think that that makes perfect sense. So, and and I do think if you find yourself getting in too deep, uh, taking that break is so important. Um, and you'll find you get cool ideas uh, that you come back that you don't if you just sort of hit it hard you know, from dawn till dusk and then wake up and do it over and over again, uh, you, you won't necessarily get that. Um, so, and for context, Little Red Alchemist wants us to know they made a 41 person deep family tree. Uh, so that uh, sort of lets us know the minutia they're getting uh, stuck in. How about you, Brandon? Um, you know, uh, minutia and uh, it driving you mad. Uh, how do you, how do you go through all of that? How do you work out issues and don't let it drive you crazy i'm kind of in a weird different basket i've never i can say i've never really gotten caught in the minutia but that's mainly because i don't particularly view it as a designer and i don't view it from that angle whenever i think about my project especially swordsfall i'm always a person in that world i'm always a an unnamed viewer you know and I always go from that angle because when you think about it like that, like if we think about it in real life, like, man, we don't even know the 41 person family tree of our own family tree. There's multi-billion dollar corporations because of that. <laughs> so you have to ask yourself, like, is this something that I, the designer would want to know? Is this relevant to anybody in the world? Is this ever going to come up? You know, and it's just, it's, it's easier for me when I just look at it from that level. Like that's always, that's always how I design. That's always how I imagine things. I imagine the world from someone there. I imagine my characters from the view of an unnamed person on their crew. Like for instance, when I designed the killer crew who incidentally is like some of my most popular characters so far, I always imagined them not from a designer and not from like an artist standpoint. I always imagined it as being somebody on a ship watching these things happen. Mm -hmm. I imagined, well, I imagine it from the view of some random ship person watching Nubai become the captain. And that's always the view that I write from. That's always the view I design from because especially as a player, that's the level that you're going to be interacting on in the first place. So that extra minutia only really matters to the designer and someone who knows all intricacies to the back end. But the average person won't. And you will have some people who are interested in that and it, on a design side, I'm not always sure that's needed. I feel like in some ways, that's why people talk a lot about feeling trapped by lore. I feel like that's really what they're talking about. It's not so much the lore, it's the level of detail that makes it feel like you have to read the 18 chapters to understand why to do some simple thing when you can't just be hand-waved. A lot of things in life can be hand-waved. Like, if you stop to think about it, how does any of this stuff that we're doing works? Like, how how am I talking to you on this magic weird electric box yeah. like you know we could and talk about a monitor but like really does it make sense to you like, would you if we all died tomorrow would you be able to recreate it like you're just using something that someone else has made and you just you just believe what they tell you to they're like yeah it's got circuits and electricity and you're like cool and it, the world's the same way so sometimes you don't have to have that level of detail because the people in the world are gonna go cool well i don't really care what you did to make my food i just want to know is it tasty and will i live and then after that, you can kind of tell people whatever you want. It's the essence of the fish story, you know? Mm -hmm. Like we really care about the ends and everything in between is whatever, you know? 
as long as it lines up enough to justify it. And same thing with the world. Like you don't have to detail the 47 Kings previously to the current one because does it have an impact on your story? Does it have an impact on the people in the world? Will it benefit anybody to have that knowledge? If I know all 47 Kings, what do I get? Yeah. You know, so it's like you just have some information that someone knows and it's cool to know that. But if we're talking about games, knowledge is power. And if you give someone a piece of knowledge, they expect to have power with it. And if all they have is like, cool, you know, some extra lore, it, it feels fluffy to people in a way that just doesn't feel fun anymore. And you're like, well, I don't care. We're just going to make up whatever, and we're on a boat, and there's some zombies, and whatever. Cool. Yeah. And that's what people will do at the table, and that's the essence of what a hack is when you're just like, I don't care about the fluff anymore, but I like how it tells me how to kill stuff, so that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And when you give people enough to get them interested, a, a, a GM, especially at a table, is going to take the, the threads that you give and go, oh, I see what you're doing here. Did they see exactly what you saw? Maybe. Maybe not, but they think they did, and it gives them that that spark to then do their own thing. And then, you know, you have a good game. And it's just kind of remembering the things that matter, the things that impact the the real stuff. You know, like when you think about our day-to-day -day life, like we care more about like how we're gonna eat and how we're gonna sleep and everything else in between is like, what's fun? <laughs> and we don't really care how it got there, you know? Like we care when we sit down for trivia night, but otherwise like, meh, like we're like, yeah, it's cool. And it, it, you'd be surprised in how much a game world is the same way. Like, cause I like to do like little experiments with my lore. I'll leave stuff out to see if anybody will notice. And the amount of stuff that people kind of just go with, it makes me realize that you just, it's the roller coaster ride, you know? I don't have to know how the magic trick works. I don't have to know how the roller coaster works. It's just, as long, am I fun? And was I alive afterwards? And <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> it came the same way, you know? You just want to have fun with your friends and like, did you have fun? And were you alive afterwards? And the people that are really into it will get into it. And for those people that do lore, that's why I'm trying to make the novels and the short stories really work. Because I think there are some designers out there that may not realize it, but they're really more authors who like to make RPGs occasionally. And that's okay. And it's just like, maybe you should take some of that lore and try to work into a novel or short stories. And there will be people who will love to sit down and read your books, mm -hmm. you know? I love that. Yeah, that, I think that's very true and, and good advice. Uh, and uh, if there's one place that might be more lucrative than role-playing games. Um, it's novels. Uh, it's all businesses, but, uh, you know. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of tie-in, man. Yeah. I mean, I've had people who only heard about Swords Fall from the little short story I did. Mm -hmm. And the story was what made them take it seriously because we still have a lot of people that think RPGs is D&D, &D, and they don't think the D&D &D that we know. They think the stereotypical D&D. &D. It's still very out there. So getting people in a different media source, sometimes it's all you need. It's just, it's, it's the lock. It's, it's, it's just the thing that makes them go, oh, it's more than just being imaginary. There's like a cool story. Oh, well, oh, okay. You know, that's cool. And, and you know, it definitely, works. Definitely, definitely. And that's why we need a, a variety of games too, right? The, the number of people who don't want to play D&D &D because they're not into fantasy and elves and dwarves, but th they hear about something else and they're like, oh, there's a, there's an RPG for that. I can do that. I can play this kind of story. Um, it's huge. Uh, and that's how we get more people into this game. I know it gets brought up all the time, but fantasy football, guys. <laughs> like, there's millions of people. Honestly, there's millions of people that play a role-playing game, and they don't know it because they don't see it like that. So, like, right. I was daring someone else that, like, I want to see a fantasy football jam, and I want to see people try to take those essence of those mechanics that get people into that and see how we can fish them into RPGs, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. there's got to be, so, I, I don't know, I'm not that that deep into the football mechanics, but I know someone could come up with something crazy D&D related, like, would 100% get down with team whatever cool thing, you know, so. Totally, totally. Team that's more. Jim, I see you uh, nodding along uh, enthusiastically here. Uh, wh what is your take? How do you avoid the madness or dive into the madness? <laughs> <laughs> uh so many things i want to say and we would be here for the rest of our our time if we were to dive into them all uh because i would get too deep into the minutia of the answer probably um but uh the uh yeah don't don't, don't laugh at that it's terrible it's terrible uh so a couple things i do want to say i you know i starting with um 
God, I feel like I'm always echoing points, but the points are so good they need to be echoed. Um, uh, starting with sort of what, what Alex said, uh, you know, one of the first things, if you're a designer that is getting stuck in the minutia, that I would definitely ask yourself and, and try to honestly ask yourself, why am I getting stuck in this minutia? Because a very common thing that can be very hard to admit, I absolutely had this problem, is that I'm getting stuck in the minutia because it's easier for me to flex my creative muscles doing new world building than doing the, a work part of making the game. So I'm diving into minutia because I'm avoiding a different aspect of completing a game. Uh, and I know, again, that's something that, that I've had a problem with in, in the past and something that I have to regularly keep in check or I will continue to do that. Um, you know, the, the other side of it is, uh, you know, again, just echoing kind of what, what Brandon was talking about a little bit. Um, is you know a lot of people uh because we're, we're we're all you know if you're making rpg presumably you're an rpg player and we love worlds we love exploring worlds we love diving into them we love creating them and a lot of people once they start creating a world they want to go through and create all the aspects and all the details and know all of the different things and uh, again as our our uh, questioner said the, the the 41 person family tree um and that appeals to us as an rpg player but as an RPG designer, what we really should be doing is trying to encourage that inspiration in the people that play our games. Mm -hmm. And one of the best ways to do this, and again, this is just echoing exactly what Brandon said, is by leaving holes. You know, and that's what I found I do a lot now to, to sort of encourage that. And I've got a lot of positive feedback from it of, you know, uh, just taking a hypothetical example from our person who's asked the question here on the panel, if I'm like, okay, I've, I've got the, the, the royal lineage and okay, well, people are talking about the royal lineage in it. So I need to, to, you know, put it all out and figure out what the 41 person thing is. And if I go, wait, what if instead of that, I just go, you know, and, and uh, the queen's brother, he disappeared when he was 21 years old and no one has seen him since. I get to make nothing else. I get to stop doing the minutia and someone who reads that's going to go, well, I'm interested in telling a story in this kingdom and there's a missing brother. I wonder what that is. Mm -hmm. And it's then encouraging inspiration from you doing less work. Uh, so that's one of, to me, the, the, the big tools that I used is once I start trying to get too deep into that level of minutia, it's a like, okay, you know, what if I just let that be a dot, 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 or a question mark, and then the GMs that pick up and play and, and run the game I'm doing can be inspired by that. And instead of me having those thoughts and en enacting them and giving the answer to that question, I'm proposing that question, allowing them to, uh, to sort of fill it out from there. So those are the couple things. Uh, one other thing, because we sort of talked about it in lore, I'll just say, because we've run, run wonderful long on this topic uh, with a lot of good information, is if you do get, because I see this a lot from uh, designs that are shown to me and pitched to me, uh, if you get stuck in the minutia of mechanical design, and a lot of times I, I see this as an example <laughs> that I've seen more than once is, okay, if I swing and hit you with a sword, I roll a d20 and add plus two to it. But if I shoot you with a bow, well, then what we have to do is we you, you roll the d20, but then you have to add a wind modifier based on the direction of travel and all this. And it goes, okay, you're trying to now simulate an arrow flying through the air when you're not simulating a sword strike. And you have different levels. And a lot of times what I find is it becomes from people's personal interest. Uh, you know, the example I'm giving is, is a true story, and I won't name who it, whoa, who it is. Uh, but they did competitive archery. Like, <laughs> they knew everything there was to know about archery, <laughs> but their game wasn't about archery. It was about medieval combat. And this one section of it had five times the detail of any other section in, in the mechanics of it. Uh, and obviously, that results in a, in a massive imbalance. Uh, my guideline for, for when I look at mechanics is I go, I should put enough att attention to detail in a ratio compared to how people are going to engage with it. You know, if I'm if I'm making a traditional fantasy RPG and combat is going to be 50 percent of the game, it can be 50 percent of the mechanics. Uh, but then if ship making is something that one group is going to do every 10 games, it shouldn't be 25 percent of the mechanics of the game. 
uh, because we're at a huge imbalance in, in what players are going to engage with. Now, that line's not not by any means a hard line, but sort of a general guideline of, of understanding. So if you catch yourself getting in the mechanical minutia of your system, you know, one of the things I would encourage you to do is look is, is this more mechanically detailed than other aspects of the game? And does that fit with that being a larger portion of the play experience? And if not, then that's a way to realize like, oh, I'm getting into this for X, Y, Z reason. And I need to start asking myself why. Yes. Can I add real quick that like in the essence of your your friend who was into Bo, that this is where I say that people should take their hobbies and their loves and make that a thing. Like if you know that much about bows and you should have a game called Bow Master that should be about the in-depth of bow and classes. Yes. About, you know, I mean, there, there's room for that. And then you can show that and then actually build mechanics and not just try to shove it into something. I'd like to see something like that, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, Alex, I, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I really... Um... I really like the idea of people just like putting their whole unrelated to games passion into a game. Like I, I totally agree with you, Brandon, like let the bow guy make the bow game. And then we can like just play with that and just talk about like, what do you really love about the bow? And maybe it's not even about the mechanical um, simulation aspects of it. Like mm -hmm. what's your passion for that? What draws you into that? What's a, um, what is an archery tournament? Like what's the social dynamics there? Um, like, I'm super interested. So I would be like, just put, make that your whole thing. <laughs> um, but also, yeah. and, and I think that's, that's true. Um, that, you know, to bring it back to lore, like if that's what you super, super love is just filling in all the blanks of the world, then like have fun with that. But also really ask yourself, like how much of that do I need to tell players? You know, can I have this huge hundred thousand page document that is all the world and then I kind of just tell the players three or four sentences and all of that can be back there and it can be informing what I'm doing, or it can be giving me creative energy by playing with it and writing about it. But yeah, I think like, what, do, what are your players, what's, what's more interesting for your players to have and what's going to keep their interest or lose their interest. Something that I really love doing is playing with how little I can give players. Mm -hmm. um, Starcross has basically no setting information in it. I have examples. Um, I really resisted the publisher's very sensible um, urge to like include like a list of like suggested pairings. Um, For the Queen has like five cards with like five sentences, grand total, and that's your whole setting. Um, my favorite, I, Jason Morningstar and I worked on something called the Phobolex Interstellar Corporate Retreat, um, which is about a bunch of aliens who work for an intergalactic corporation and they're on like a really cheesy retreat trying to do like an icebreaker exercise. And um, <laughs> I love it's, that. <laughs> it's a super, super fun live action kind of like an icebreaker that makes fun of icebreakers. So it's very good for people who are very sick of those, like LARP designers, um, who it's designed for. But what was so fun about that was putting as little information as possible and just telling people, okay, you guys are Gantrafax and you folks are uh, gemmers and you're orb guardians, and not telling them what an orb is or what a Gantrafax is, or what happens when you, whatever. And so, and and just giving them questions. So saying like, okay, Gantrafaxes, tell me what happens when you enter a third cycle, or, you know, decide amongst yourselves what your, um, uh, what your sounds are like or whatever. And so giving them basically nothing and just asking them questions, it was amazing, you know, and we would just be like, uh, like play testing the game, we'd look over and be like, all the Gantrafaxes are holding hands. Yeah, we didn't tell them to, I don't know, that's, they're all just doing it. Okay, that's <laughs> and it's so much more gratifying to see what people would come up with and what they would fill in the blanks with than to give like our idea of what would be fun or interesting or cool. So really, um, I really think about how fun it can be for people to take your ideas in directions that you never would have thought of. Like, it's not just better for the player. I truly think that it's better for the creator and it's more fun and it keeps me more engaged. I guess I get bored very easily <laughs> um, to just to just like toss stuff out there and be like, I, what is it? I don't know what it is. You tell me. Yeah. Hearing hearing those stories of how people have played your game and they surprise you. There's no better feeling, I think, as a creator. Um, and also, uh, oh, yeah, I was at one thing. Um, there's also a way to hint or show minutia without actually having to write it out. Mm -hmm. 
like in the instance going back to like the 47 king lineage i like that example because i personally know of a lot of people who that's a specific specific one they can't help but get into family lines i see it really often but one classic thing is is things like instead of having to say the number of it you can just have something like um association with the numbers like we are the 47 like what is that oh well that's the number of rulers and then you you leave that open so now people know there's x and then if you're setting which a lot of them do already have some sort of naming convention people will start filling in the blanks mm -hmm. and then you can just be like yeah and then you know in their middle dynasty we had a, a number of hot-headed ones and then people can take that and take how they want it to and you can do that and show that there's depth and just do it really short and then like Alex was saying, people can kind of take that as they want. Maybe you were thinking hot-headed in terms of running out and killing people and someone else thought of hot-headed in terms of was always running their mouth or someone thought, hey, this is a perfect excuse to have a redhead because people do that too. I don't know. You let them just do whatever they want, but you still get to show there's depth and they make up what that is, you know? Yeah. It's a great way to handle, uh, you know, if you have those great, 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 granddaddy issues um you know saying okay i want it to be i, I know people aren't going to care about this but i want people to know that this it, this is a long line of rulers right mentioning that i think you're totally right brandon like giving giving that depth is enough for people to say oh okay and then if they need to name all 47 kings they can do that <laughs> you know um it's a it's a good way to do things and jim to your point of uh designing so that people engage with the game the way you want to and then leaving the blanks so you get surprised i think is a is a great point right like uh for instance uh, in starcross's case uh you would not necessarily have six stats uh, you know strength dexterity and constitution and roll a d20 to resolve issues because that's not a great way to simulate a relationship or uh, necessarily maybe some relationships but not all um you know but it works great for d and d and and other games that harness those six stats so jim you know how do we then get down like we've we've got our idea you know we've we've got some design rolling and that kind of thing how do we keep those mechanics in mind and and design and refine mechanics so that they're supporting that idea Oh, that is a wonderfully broad question. <laughs> um, <laughs> how do you mechanic? Yeah, how how um, do you make a game? Uh... <laughs> uh, so I will I will use I will use an example uh, to to hopefully ho hopefully uh, tell kind of again m my process on it. Um, which, and again, in my process, I establish, you know, d design goals. So we're going to use, actually, the, the first game that I, well, the first game I published, the first game I made, I was eight years old, and it was a copy of Hugo Three Jungle of Doom that I made on paper. <laughs> uh, but the first game that I actually published, uh, yeah, the one that you, you, you can get a copy of, not the one that I still have to this very day sitting in a file. Um, but the uh, reflections, uh, you know, the, the basic core idea of the game um was uh the the overall you know sort of i'm gonna say game pitch of it is uh you're two samurai that have come together to sort of have an epic duel to the death and the game starts at the moment where you've come together to have this duel and then you flash back in time and you live through the events of their life that led them from being good friends to bitter enemies and ultimately one or both will die in the end uh and that's sort of the the, the concept of the game and uh where the game's core idea and function actually came from was the Disney movie Up, if anyone remembers that. The first five minutes of that movie had me in tears because they took characters that I didn't know and in five minutes told me an entire story, had me caring and had just a gut punch at the end of it, which then leads us into the story of the movie. Um, and what the realization from that was, was if we had a game that could take people handhold them through the narrative structures that you need to tell a a um tragedy a, a sort of a traditional tragedy story uh my belief was i saw i go in five minutes this was disney did this so as long as we hit these beats 
it should theoretically uh, result in the same uh, uh, impact. Like if we can have players go through the story beats of a tragedy, they will get to feel that impact from it. And that was literally that sort of design goal was what the intention of the game was. Uh, and the samurai was just sort of tra trappings for it. Um, partly marketing, partly because uh, I was known as, as that L5R guy for the first two years that I was <laughs> wonderfully on the internet. But uh, that, that being the design goal. So then how do you design mechanics? I knew a part of the answer, which was, okay, I need to, I, I need to make a game where, I, again, I, players have to willingly on their own go through the story beats of a tragedy. How do we do that? I, you can't do that with modifiers and like, oh, roll a D plenty plus four. That's not going to, to result in that. Uh, so what the I essentially set about was making the mechanics that would encourage people to do that. And the, the end result of that was the core mechanic of the game is you go back and play through scenes. There's five scenes in the game, and each of those is sort of the core story beat of, of a tragedy. Um, and to get players to to play into that beat essentially you have each player has a pre-selection of uh things they're trying to accomplish in in a scene and they win points if they accomplish what they're trying to narratively accomplish but all of those objectives are getting the other player to do something through role play if you get them to do that through role play then you score your points so now what we have is we have a game where I am trying to get you to do something. It's a two player RPG and you're trying to get me to do something. And through doing that and through our, our sort of a slot of objectives that we have, all of a sudden players are playing into the tropes of each stage of that tragedy. And then when they get to the end of it, they go, oh, I'm really feeling for these characters. And, and the joke I've, I've had forever is it's uh, uh, the game will get you to cry in one hour, your money back. Um, mm. and, and no one's taken me up on, on the offer yet. Uh, but that that's sort of how, how, again, Jim McClure mechanics a game is what am I trying to accomplish? What am I trying to get the players to feel? And then how do I put together mechanics? And and way too often in design, we think of mechanics as as, as pluses and minuses to roles and bell curve distribution versus flatline distribution. Mm -hmm. When when mechanics can mean many, many, many different things. Um, and understanding how to to use those different mechanics, you know, everything from uh, you know, like I said you're trying to get the other person to do something via role play to touching a Jenga tower is, is part of a mechanic. Um, you know, all of these different things, which will give our wonderful lead, lead into Alex there. Um, you know, all of these different things can be used in interesting ways uh, to have mechanics for your game and, and to make it sort of alive and do what, you know, what you want to do with them. Yeah, um, Alex, like, let's jump off right there. Uh, you know, for you, uh, because your process is never the same twice, um, you know, and, and you like to be surprised uh, and you like to explore through design, um, at what point are, are you honing in? At what point are you like, yeah, this this is a game here. This is this is it. This is the game. You know, we, we've got it ready to roll. Uh, you know, like, how do you work that? And when do you know? Um. So again, it, it depends. Um, something that I really wanted to make sure. Um, so with with Starcrossed, I was in in playtesting. I was always kind of just watching how people seem to feel. Um, I can't get into people's emotional experience, but I can see when they are giggling, when they are putting their hands in front of their face like this. Um, <laughs> I can see when people are leaning back from the table and going. Whew, um, and so when those things are happening, I'm, I'm going, okay, what was the antecedent of that? Keep it. And I can see when players are looking lost or when they're looking distant or when they're not looking at each other and they start looking down at the rules and leafing through them. Um, and I can say, okay, what preceded that? Um, oh, change it. Um, figure something else out. Uh, so I'm, I think I'm primarily just looking at the emotional response of, um, of my players. Um, so that's how I know if something is working or not. And then in terms of like, what's, what's going to be there, what's the mechanic? Um, it, it's funny that people talk about, uh, the tower when it comes to Starcross, because I think that's the least interesting thing about it. Um, the, the tower is just hoisted from, um, uh, from dread. You know, I, I, uh, was very inspired by Epidiah Ravichal in the same way that 
Jim was inspired by the maker of a single moment, uh, I think Toby Abad. So like that was kind of just like, okay, imported, no problem. What I think is fun about Starcrossed are things like the way that scenes are structured. Um, I think uh, <laughs> I had to figure out how I could get players to stop talking so comfortably with each other. I wanted them to be deeply, powerfully uncomfortable when they were engaging in like character to character dialogue. And so when I didn't have rules around how you could um, have dialogue as characters, um, it was just very unsatisfying and, and people were just talking and they were kind of chatty and scenes would go on really long. And I was like, no, this is terrible. This is not, they're so just fine and happy and comfortable. This cannot stand. Um, and so the idea, where did, right. Yeah. So I literally just kind of like sat up really straight in my seat one time. It was just like, oh yeah, I should get them to touch the tower the entire time because then they'll be terrified. They'll be terrified that they're going to accidentally knock the tower over. And so the way that they speak is going to be very brief and it's going to be very hushed and the stakes are going to feel really high mm -hmm. and they'll never say as much as they want to. And that to me sounds like talking to someone you have a big crush on. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, I, a lot of that actually came from something called the phallus method um, from a LARP called Just a Little Lovin um, that I won't get into describing here, but, um, but that was very much inspired by that, that too. And so I think a lot of times when you're making something, be thinking about like, what do I want? And has someone already solved this? Like, has someone already done this? And is there, and you know, to go, to go back to what Brandon was talking about, about like adapt what already exists and say, okay, if I want my players to feel X, well, when players, I know when players do Y, they feel X. So maybe I can take Y wholesale or in, in credit, or I can adapt it, or how would that fit in here? What's the version of that? It would work with what I'm trying to do or with what's with the affordances of whatever I've already made. Um, so yeah, I would say start by stealing for sure. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> just take that tower, take the false method, take whatever, and then be like, okay, but how, how does it work here? Right. Um, yeah. Cause mechanics are, I think I benefit a lot from um, most of my work has been in tabletop, but I've really probably learned a lot more from live action play. Mm -hmm. Um, where a mechanic can be anything. A mechanic can be throwing a ceramic cup on the ground every time you feel a strong emotion. Um, a mechanic can literally just be anything that you do. And I think having that in mind of just mechanics are things that you do um, is very freeing, I think. Yeah, it's why it, it's a big benefit to read a lot of games, play a lot of games, and, and games, I do mean the broad category, right, of games. Not just role-playing games, but, uh, you know, if you can play a lot of crazy board games, if you can play, you know, uh, and are able to, like, get out there and, and play some Twister and think about how you, can you work Twister into your RPG, right? Like, um, there might be something interesting there. So uh, it's it's taking those ideas and twisting them and turning them and making them into something new, remixing, is a, is a big help, which is a perfect point, I think, to throw it over to you, Brandon, um, because... And you and I have talked about this before on my podcast, but I'd love for you to get into it again uh, with what you're doing with Swordsfall and why it works for what you were talking about earlier. You know, this idea of spirits and then how that's related to the mechanics of your game. Yeah. Um, first off, I have to say, because I've been thinking about this, and this is a classic example of this. What if it was some sort of virus that turned the potatoes <laughs> semi-sentient. Like, then you get different classes based on the type of potatoes or, or more like what they are. So you'd have like waffle fries would be like a tank class. Ah, and then like okay. yep. French fries could be like melee. God, See what I'm saying? So good. Like, so good. You know, and right. you have their different factions and like treacherous taters and this is how i design literally this is how i design i've been thinking about it the whole time i was like how do i describe it it's like i hear a word and it doesn't even have to mean anything but dude said poisoned potatoes and we laughed and somewhere my brain goes challenge accepted right and yep. it, you know and then i'm like and i played around with my head and i go i i like to do a lot of like allegory so i'm like poison potatoes that's a fun word what else is potato-ish that I could up oh, sinister spuds, and then you know it's like that just gets my brain going, and then I started thinking of all different kind of potatoes, and I'm like, but do you have like factions? Do you have like red potatoes? Which is like 
Idaho potatoes? You know, do you have like <laughs> Idaho potatoes are beefier, so they're more of like a you know, and he just and that's I like to just play at it and poke at it, and then there's a funny thing that happens. Like some of the best ideas are the ones that you laugh at, and it's mm-hmm. weird thing oh yeah because laughter is a weird thing. You know, like it may not be because the word itself is funny, right? But there's an image in your head that it brings. And I found that like when you have an idea and it kind of makes you laugh and it makes you smile, there's a kernel of something there. And all we're trying to do in a game is capture how to have someone else have that same reaction without you being in the room, right? So once I start planning the idea, like I can already imagine, like I, I really like this example and I hope that that this is a thing that happens because it cracks me up. But I can literally think of like you're 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 going through the store and you're looking for a game. This is kind of how I imagine it too. Cause a lot of the times the games we make, honestly, people are not gonna know what they are. You know, it's lucky when people know who we are, but a lot of times we're just blind. But you see it on the spine, you're like poisonous potatoes, and you're like, that just sounds weird. But we have a tendency to want to look at it more because the brain goes, I know those both of those words. I don't know why they go together on an RPG. I have to know more, right? And so that's kind of your hook. So then I imagine like on the cover, it's like some form of potato and it's just something, something that makes it go, huh, I have to open this up. It could either be, maybe you want to go with an action kind of vibe because that's the kind of game you imagine. You imagine, you know, a potato with like the Rambo, you know, bandana or something like that. Or maybe you think that, oh man, what if uh, we had some sort of love comedy, you know, but you, you, you play with that idea, but you have that essence on the cover and then everything from there is just trying to get people drip by drip into that moment where you laughed you know and ideally hopefully they laugh Mm. the second you laughed but maybe they don't so you have to kind of get it there and if you wanted to be and this is kind of what i was saying about theme like if you wanted to be a horror theme then you would make sure that your your messaging sounds like it and you think about okay what makes something sound scary because potatoes makes you kind of want to laugh but i want it to be like a you laugh, but it's not funny, funny. It's like a creepy clown kind of funny, like a horror movie. You're kind of laughing because you're nervous sort of laughter. So then you think like, how can I, how can I paint that picture? And that's where, you know, like Alex was saying, like stealing is really good because then you go, okay, what is kind of cheesy, but still horrified me. And if I was making this game, I would think of uh, killer clowns from outer space. Cause that's like the classic example of like cheesy, weird, creepy horror. You're laughing, but it's creepy. You're like, is this comedy? Is it horror? Like, I don't really know. So I would think about like, what are moments in that that made me go, oh, and then think about how could I take that and apply it to potatoes? You know, is it the, the creepy clown imagery? Would it be the same if I put creepy clown makeup on a potato? Would that be the same? You know, and you kind of, in a way you have to play with it to try to bang out what your theme is, what that moment is that made you want to make it. Because that's why the minutia is like an endless trap because the minutia is not what you got into it for. Banusha is not what made you want to make the game. Banusha is not what you want to make to play the game. That's just the designer part. So if you try to keep hold of the parts that made you laugh or made you excited or made you go, who, who, idea, you're just trying to get people to see that and double down on that. And that's why, that's why games can be so, so dynamic, you know, because fun takes place in so many different forms and fun is just about hitting the right buttons, you know, and Mm -hmm. The nice thing about RPG is you kind of, in a way, get to have enough buttons to where technically you could get just about anybody if you could stretch your imagination enough, you know? Mm-hmm. You could have someone who goes, ah, Poisonous Buds, that's silly. I like serious games. Or, you know, you could easily have a system mechanically deep enough for someone to go, if I close my eyes and pretend this is like Mouse Guard, maybe I can go with it, you know? And and now you have someone playing your game. It's It's a... It's a weird component and when you just make it about the theme and the fun and then try to figure out how to make that work at your table like you can design anything <laughs> yeah anything yeah like poisonous potatoes that's right it's happening right now uh, which which this is something that like i i really wanted to make in, in sorts well not not poisonous potatoes but i wanted to have it to where i could take just about any element and do it so I really worked on making sure I had enough pieces to where if I wanted to go, okay, I have the need to make something horror. Mm -hmm. Do I have the building blocks to do that? Would I have to make something else? And that was how I designed my own territories because I thought of them as theme. 
And then instead of going to Minutia, I went, well, the Ebbing Cascade, people don't go there because it's terrible. And people go, oh, and I'm like, yeah, there's stuff there. And I go, oh, what kind of stuff? Bad stuff. And people just started already making it. But what about Dragon? What about this? And at some point, you don't even have to say anything. You go, yeah, maybe, or dot, dot, dot. And they go, oh, did you mean something else? Maybe. What are you thinking? <laughs> and and a book can be in the same way. You can just uh, open up these themes to, well, at this place, creepy things happen. Or on the aisle, it's really beautiful. And that's where people get married. So it makes a great place to have some sort of of awesome Jenga Tower themed comedy or, or love or, you know, you, and sometimes you don't have to design that. You just have to give the space and you do that with themes and thinking, I always think of, I paint broadly. That's kind of how I imagine it. I think of I define the box, like the very outer edges. Like, what's the stuff that I would never want in Swords Fall? That's the box. That box is as big or as small as it is because you're just thinking, what's the stuff I don't want in it? Cool. That's my box. That's my sandbox. Now I just make stuff in it. Yes. You know, and and when you do that, then it makes coming up with stuff really easy. So I can come up with stuff on the fly. You know, I came up with a character the other day for Swords Fall while watching a TV show when I made a little comment on Twitter and I was like, man, wouldn't it be funny? And then I just made it. And it was really easy because I had the tools in the world to do that. And I knew what theme I wanted. So it was easy to go, okay, well, I wanted to have this cool Avenger lone wolf guy. So this territory would be great because that's the mood for it. And anybody who's read a little bit about Swords Fall goes, oh yeah, that makes total sense. And it fits in, you know, and that's awesome. works for everything. So that, you know, that brings me to the uh, talking about the sandbox. If you want to bring in other people to play in your sandbox, you know, um, there, there aren't that many people who can do it all. You know, there aren't that many Cecil Howes who can draw and do layout and they edit their own stuff and they're their own play test coordinator and, the, you know, all of these things. Um, so, Brandon, you know, how do you find people to work with? Where, where do you look for people um, and uh, and that sort of thing? How do you build your team? A, a lot of Googling. Mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> so when I started Source Soul, it, it was just me because that's all it was, just me and I was writing it. And then I realized I wanted a logo and I had made my own, but I'm not a graphic designer. And it was like, okay, but I wanted a really good logo. I wanted something that people would be like, oh, tell me more. So then I'd have a reason to bring up the story because that was honestly my excuse. It was like, I just want an excuse to tell you about the story. Maybe the logo will get you there. So went through a whole bunch of ads and um, honestly, because this is the part that I know people don't like the most, but I haven't found another way. But sometimes building your team is just good old fashioned grind and elbow work and Googling and going through Twitter and the hashtags and putting up a Reddit ad. And it's it's not easy, but if you think about it, that's why the classic trope for so many games in anime is building your crew. Because building a crew of talented people is an adventure. It is not hard. Like most of the time building your crew is really the hard part of your project and not even the actual sitting down to type it. And that's a weird reality. So for me, I just kind of was like, all right, I'm 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 looking for a certain kind of people. I knew that for like my graphic designer, I wanted someone who was going to listen to me because I knew I had a certain look. I just had no idea what that was. <laughs> so I needed someone who was gonna like work with me that I was gonna be like, well, I'm looking for this. Does this make sense? And I can show you references and not everybody does that. And that's a thing as well. Some people just want you to have exactly the finished product and then they can make it and some people want total control so i had to go through a bunch of people and i came across taylor and just the conversation with him and the beginning was really cool he had already done some rpg work which meant that it made it easier for him to understand the theme of what i was going for and then we worked together on a logo and then for my lead artist tumo i found him via ArtStation and mm -hmm. and uh pinterest <laughs> which as I think this is like my usual thing. I always say Pinterest is massively underrated. If you're looking for artists, it is crazy how much Pinterest is good for that. If you're looking for art, like it, art period Pinterest. So anyway, I was looking through, looking for black fantasy art because I was looking for stuff to inspire me and stuff to fill out my world anvil before I thought I was ever going to be a real thing. And I found his, he had made a, a, a fan art of Black Panther 
And that was kind of what inspired me to really sit down and do Swordsfall. And I was like, oh yeah. I was like, this is a guy I need to work with. And it took like three emails and it took like two, three months. Sorry, two months, but it did. But it, it took a while, but I was like, this is the guy I want to like do art for me. And I waited for that, you know? So you have to take your team seriously. And I think sometimes people are so ready to get the thing out there that they just pick anybody. And it's not a knock to anybody, but sometimes some people's vision or the way they work does not go with what you're looking for. Mm. And it will show. Like you'll have a book that feels like it had too many cooks in the kitchen because it did. And like one of the best things about Swords Fall is it feels like one vision because I made sure to get people who were interested in what I was selling. Like it wasn't just about, can you do the art? It was like, are you into doing some cool new like diverse afropunk like i want to do a whole bunch of stuff and finding people that were like oh yeah and they're excited to do it and that brings a whole different level than if i was just shopping if i just picked the first person off of twitter or if i just went with people that i like personally because i feel like that's a subtle trap there's a difference between giving your friends money and having them involved in a project that may make you look at them differently because sure. that's something I've seen in the community a little bit. And that's, it's a hard thing. That's why they talk about doing business with friends. It's a very murky thing. And if you're doing a project, sometimes you have to look at it critically and be like, what am I looking for? Mm-hmm. Like, what exactly am I looking for? And would it just be better if I just sent 20 books to my friend on Ko-Fi and then got the artist I wanted? Or is this the thing I want? You know what I mean? So being critical in those little ways and being willing to like stick with it. Like I, I kind of knew what kind of art I wanted. I just didn't know who made it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so it took a while and, and I went through like for Drift of Dreams, I went through about probably about 45 people to whittle it down to the 10, well, to whittle it down to about like 16 and then the 10 I have or the 10 that responded. And yeah, and it, it takes, takes time, you know? And also one thing that happens is especially if you're like me and you're on the writing design side, as much as like we work with artists, artists have their own little world that like has its own rules that you have to either have someone guide you through or just be really honest in the fact that like, I don't know what the art rules are. If I offend you, correct me, you know, cause it's a thing and other artists will like to work with other artists. So if you have white artists, you'll be surprised at how many people just want to be in the same team as them because artists are their own fans. So they, they fan, they fan out over other people. So you can use that as a resource, you know? So if you know, there's an artist who has a nice following, maybe that's the person you pursue first. So that way, once you have them on your team, other artists might be more willing to, that's the thing that happens as well. Like I had more people that were willing to work with me when um, I had Jonah Loeb because they were like, Oh, like he's done major stuff. Like, okay. Like that means you're serious or, or, how some artists think they go, okay, well, he's a person who wouldn't stand to not get paid. So that means you probably pay. That's a thing too. Yeah. You know? Yeah, so. definitely. And artists are terrible at communication uh, in general, right? <laughs> uh, that that story about it taking months for you to get in touch with an artist feels uh, painfully familiar. <laughs> painfully, painfully familiar. Yeah. Uh, so Jim, how do you go about finding a team other than asking your most handsome friend to work with you? Um, how do you, how do you go about creating a team? Well, I, I've not officially done a project with James D'Amato, so I'm not entirely sure what you're referring wow. to. But, um, wow. Oh, I know. Painful, Jim but very heel. true, but very true. <laughs> um, but uh, just for, for the, the, the sake of time, because I know we're running late, what I'm going to tell you is uh, my best advice for you is rewind this video a couple minutes and just re-listen to everything Brandon just said. Um, I Honest to goodness, I everything I was going to say, he just said. So rewind a couple minutes, listen to what he said. I think that is exactly spot on great advice. Uh, the two, I, I will just provide two resources as footnotes to that. Um, one being, if, if you're in the RPG community, uh, there's an organization called the IGDN, the Indie Game mm-hmm. Developers Network, um, mm-hmm. which is a very, very good organization that even if you're not, of course, you can apply for membership, uh, which if you're new to RPGs, it's a good way to sort of start plugging yourself into the community of designers. But even if you're not, if you're just looking for resources and recommendations on you know people that, that work in the industry, uh, that is a good place to go to contact them uh and then the other one um 
if you're looking uh, for for art, uh, I've I've had such a great experience with them that I will tout them. Uh, I do most of my art and illustration work I do through a company called Gunship Revolution, uh, which represents uh, 50 plus international uh, artists and illustrators, uh, and they do amazing work um you know i just top to bottom could not say enough good things about them uh you know the only thing i will say obviously depending on your your, your level and your budget uh you know they are more geared towards the the professional level production of stuff so it's you know they're not they're not doing a full color illustration for you for 50 bucks they're they're not that type of operation but um you know if if you are doing a a, a kickstarter project if you're looking for that professional touch i could not recommend them enough and they can do you know just a range of different styles so again rewind a couple minutes listen to brandon and then those are two two resources possibly for you excellent alex i'm also just gonna add a footnote to brandon um (laughs) (laughs) because i think that that just all of that all of that um be willing to reach out to a million different artists you know keep your eyes open all the time um and make sure that you are working with someone not just whose style you like or you know, whose previous work you've enjoyed, but someone who like gets what you're doing, mm-hmm. um, especially if they're going to be doing a lot for you. If, if they're doing a one-off illustration, you can have a quick conversation. But um, I can tell you when I, I had the delight of working with Jess Fink on Starcrossed and the fact that I could just email her and say, uh, old timey fancy man playing Jenga with an alien. And she could just immediately go like, oh yes, I know exactly what those two people should look like. I know mm-hmm. how they should be looking at each other. <laughs> I know it's it just, it's such a relief. Like it's just gonna save you so much time if you have someone who feels some kind of investment or, or understanding in your project. Um, something that I like to do generally, my like little tip is um, if you're on Twitter, but probably if you're on anything, um, if you see, if, if I see art that I really like, if I see someone's illustration that I'm super into, I think is amazing, I will immediately, whether or not I follow them, I will add them to a, a list. Like I will add them to a Twitter list of like artists who you should probably talk to about hiring. Um, that I, I don't know how we would have gotten um, 12, you know, like 12 different illustrators for, uh, for the queen to do 12 different illustrations. Um, if I didn't already have like, okay, here's 20 people who I want to work with. And e- Evil Hat, the publisher, had um, their own lists as well. But yeah, if you see someone's work that you're really into, uh, just like file that away, you know, so that when you do suddenly need a piece, you have a bunch of people to draw on whose work you, you know you already dig. Totally, totally. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to close this with one audience uh, question here. This is from Corey Hickson wants to know what's something you've designed that you're most proud of, whether it's a specific mechanic or a larger piece or something else. So I know that is a big question uh, and no one will hold you to it if you end up being more proud of something else. Um, So don't worry about that. Uh, I can see everyone getting these far away looks as they think about (laughs) their their design babies uh, that they have created. Um, Alex, are, are you good to go? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have something. Okay. Um, so I really, I'm very, very proud of Pop, which is a game I made about the people on the internet who love balloons. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be in Pelgrain Press's upcoming erotic art games anthology. They really like balloons. And uh, and I'm... Oh. No, no. We Balloon lost you. Still. Balloon popped. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Um, it's something that I wanted to make for so long and I've really convinced myself that no one else would ever care about. Um, like surely no one else would want to play my live action game that takes place online. That is about kind of about balloon sex, but it doesn't have balloons or sex in it. Um, <laughs> so I kind of just convinced myself like, okay, you have to make this game to get it out of your brain, but obviously nobody else is going to care about it. And so I'm, I made it um, while I was in residency at Mount Kaz, which is this wonderful, amazing art space. Um, Hi, Albert and Christina, you do wonderful things. Um, And I just kind of made it and, you know, ran it for the couple of people who showed up and they had such a good time. And I felt so satisfied finally getting it out there. And then, you know, and then the the anthology came up and I pitched it to them and they accepted it. And now it's going to be published in the anthology. And so, I think it's a wonderful game. I think it's more interesting and more innovative and more out there and more weird, more groundbreaking than by a thousand times than than for the Queen or Starcrossed. 
Um, I'm so proud of it. I love it so much. And the fact that it's definitely gonna, not going to be my biggest game. It's not going to be my most successful game. The fact that anyone is playing it at all and I've like reached across that, that divide I mean, um, <laughs> just really uh, just really tickles me. Like I just get very excited, very happy when I think about that. That's great. Please tell me that's the tagline for the game. <laughs> about balloon sex, but not balloons or sex. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, that's definitely how I pitch it. Don't worry, there's no balloons, and you probably won't have sex. Okay. <laughs> that's <I'll play>. great. <laughs> uh, Jim, how about you? Uh, do you have a, a thing that you're most proud of? Oh God, uh, that's honestly I should have an answer for that, but I I don't because it's uh, I I will give an answer because. because I'm not <laughs> expected to yeah. as opposed to just going nope i don't um you know i at the end of the day i love you know i referenced before the uh the the mechanical structure of reflections i really love that the long form feedback loop that i made uh in satanic panic uh the core mechanic that we have uh, that we made for the roll 20 game burn bright uh mm -hmm. all of those things i'm That's like great. are all equally in the, the the top level of proud but uh i will i will instead choose a moment Okay, that that I am I am most proud of, um, because it it just it, it was a moment to me that really encapsulated how how games can affect people and how games can uh, interact with people in in very fascinating ways. Um, for for my Patreon backers, uh, I released a game called Tiny Guardian, uh, which is a little it's a one player RPG that's played in a month. So essentially every day uh, what you do is, is you sort of read the next page of the, of the story. And uh, what it is is the story is about this little tiny fluffy creature uh, who shows up on your doorstep on day one and is like, hey, I've been sent to protect you. Um, and he, he's this cute little, little thing and you, and you draw him on a, on a piece of paper and he, he has a little uh, uh, a health stat and he has a, uh, a motivation stat. Um, and... Uh, what happens is then as you get into the game, you, you, you start, he starts becoming, or I, pardon, it, it starts becoming more involved in, in your life in certain ways. Like after the first night that it spends with you, uh, suddenly it goes like, hey, I was really cold. Can you build me a bed that I can sleep in at night? And the game expects you to make whatever you feel is an appropriate bed. And then when you read the next day's thing, it tells you, hey, if you put it in a physically put your character sheet that you drew this thing in a bed of whatever making that you have, then it's fine. And it's 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 like ability meter goes up. And if not, it loses health because it got damaged. And from this point forward, any night it doesn't spend in the bed, it'll get damaged. And then as it goes on, it wants to go to work with you one day. So you have to put it in your pocket and take it to work. And the moment that, that I got from one of my Patreon backers that I really loved is uh, at one point uh, you do something for it and it really likes you and it, it writes you this this little poem um the next morning and so you get it you read this cute little chibi poem uh from from your guardian uh and then at the bottom of that it goes and you see you see a chewed up pencil sitting beside the note and then it tells you throw away a pencil and there was no mechanical reason no benefit but i got a message from no less than 10 different people that said I just threw away a pencil and I'm not sure why, <laughs> but, but that they would connect on, on that level with, with a game and, and what is just, you know, a, a, a figment <clears throat> making of their own imagination. Um, that to me uh, is, is, is one of the moments I'm going to say that I'm, I'm most proud of not in a, I did this, but in a games can do this uh, moment. Nice. That's great. And Brandon, how about you? I'm glad Jim said that because I was thinking, I was like, man, everyone's going to assume I'm going to say Swordsfall. And don't get me wrong, Swordsfall is the greatest thing I've ever made, like, times 10. But, like, that's just a, a phone-in answer. So can I instead go with, like, my greatest as, like, as a GM? Yes. You know? Because I don't get into RPG so much to design, but because I like the thought of adding tools for other devious GMs like myself because... I'm the GM. I like to mess with my players in fun ways. And for me, I had, it was actually one of my last games with my group of friends before I moved. And it was, they were high school kids who went to a museum and time froze, except for them. Mm -hmm. And then they started realizing something happened and the guy chased them out of this museum. And then things started getting weird. A cat started talking to them and I was waiting to see if they would ever question anything. But they're RPG people, so they went along with it, right? And so the cat tells them, oh, well, 
uh, this guy is looking for people with powers and they're like, we don't have powers. And they're like, well, you're a kid and they just detected it because you're, you're young, right? So they think that, oh, we have powers and we're getting chased. I didn't say they were getting chased. They thought they were getting chased. So they ran, right? So <laughs> as far as, as I like to GM in terms of, I like to imagine that everything in the world is alive. So the players do their thing and then the NPCs do their own thing. So the NPCs didn't really notice the characters as far as I'm concerned, but now they're running. So they chased. And the whole game was watching the players fall into their own decisions. And as a GM, I just got to sit back and hand them little things and then watch them completely unmake themselves. Wow. <laughs> they ran, went to like uh, one of the characters' house, which invited all the villains to literally their home because they didn't think about the fact they were being followed. Had a called the cops. The cops showed up. They had a shootout with the villains. They decided to steal a car. Now, mind you, they're high school kids, and none of them had bothered to decide to give themselves driving because it was based in uh, Means of Mastermind, so they actually had oh, to nice. drive at some store. But they didn't think about that, but they wanted to run away, so they hopped in a car. And I asked them, and I was like, well, <laughs> none of you guys picked driving for anything, and I don't want to mess with you. So either you can take the rules as is and try to flee away with no driving skills, or you can just roll a D10 and take it as is. And they all look at each other. And <laughs> it's one of those great moments that like, we'll roll the D10. Nice. They rolled, they rolled a one. And I was like, cool. <laughs> the car crashes into a tree. Everybody gets flung out. And they all have to roll their individual damage. And one of the characters ended up taking enough damage to die. So rather than just ripping up their sheet, I decided to play with them. So the villains came up and was like, hey, your friend that died, we have his soul. He's in purgatory. And then the characters ended up going to purgatory and ended up messing with the world even more. And I just, I always let them play the story as they wanted to. I had a completely different story mapped out from the beginning. They're supposed to get a cool base and they're gonna have powers and be more like X-Men, X-Force. And by the end of a month, they made themselves, they went to purgatory. Someone somehow got impregnated by Alexander the Great. I don't know how that works, but that was my crew. And they managed to release all the bad guys and then turned evil and then ended wow. up working for the bad guys and it ended up being one of the funnest games I ever GM because I was just watching the players just do their own thing <laughs> and at any given time I could have stopped in and be like no 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 we're going back over here and instead I was like what if I just let them get themselves into their own mess mm -hmm. and I just did and as a designer it's a mem it's a thing I think about because it was a game that kind of ran ad hoc Mm -hmm. No one really wanted to play Mutant Masterminds. They didn't really know the system. They just wanted a fun game that wasn't D and D for the for a month or two because they were tired of it. And it ended up being really fun because they got into their characters. They got into the characters that they played. They started off as just a kids, and then they decided what they were going to do. And then their powers that kind of picked at random, and then they grew into that. And it was just I got to watch like my group of friends really have fun, even when they were plotting against each other. And I never told them to do that. I never made them do that. I just let them play out their consequences and I just filled in the pieces of the world. So, you know, as they went through purgatory, I put in the levels, but they decided how they wanted to go. They decided to go to the evil side, you know? And I think things like that is like, well, we kind of forget sometimes as designers that like people can have fun even running counterculture to what was planned. And sometimes that is the most fun because they feel like they're going off road. So that's always a fun time. It was also horrifying just watching them throw out chunk of story after story <laughs> every week. And then I got to the point where I realized, oh, I don't have the kind of group that I can sit down and plan out for. So I would literally write stuff as they were playing because it was like that. They would just be like, we're gonna go over here. And I'm like, why, there's nothing. Okay, you're going over there, cool. <laughs> yep, there's stuff here now. Yep, cool, what are you gonna do now? So, and it was a great experience. So. That's awesome. I wanna play in that game. That sounds really fun. Um, I'm actually going to adapt it for Swordsfall, so it was a good campaign. Nice, so. yes. Well, before we go, uh, let's just go around the table one more time. Let people know where they can find you. Alex, let's start with you. Sure. If you go to helloalexroberts.com, you'll be able to find my Twitter, um, my Patreon. I'm always doing super fun stuff on Patreon, so you should totally check me out there. Um, and everything else that I'm up to. My email address is on there if you want to get in touch, work on something, or do something. Um, yeah, those are, those are the best. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the panel. Really appreciate it. It was great to finally have a, a long conversation with you. This is cool. Yeah, same. Uh, Jim, where can people find you? 
Uh, yeah, uh, so you can you can find sort of the work I do um, on the Third Act Publishing website, which is thirdactpub.com. Uh, or if you want to directly interact with me, uh, I am uh, Twitter is sort of like my like, hey, come wave at me there um, when when my phone's not broken, which I have to fix this week. Uh, but uh, I am at GM Jim McClure uh, over on Twitter. So uh, you can pop on over there and take a look at that uh, again or the website Third Act Publishing. Excellent, excellent. You definitely want to check out Jim's stuff. It is really, really good. Uh, well, actually, we, we, we should plug one more thing, which is very, very soon. Of course, there is uh, here on the wonderful Roll20 platform, uh, Burn Bright will be, uh, I don't know, I don't know, James, if you know what the official launch date is. I don't, I don't think don't it, it's been announced yet, but uh, okay, okay, we'll say solid. soon. Uh, soon. It's coming soon, soon to Roll20. Um, it will be uh, there, ready to roll, so uh, it's very very exciting watching it all come together um and it's a lot of fun so please yep. check it out and play it and you can be a swarm of bugs so that's cool right uh or you could be a giant crystal person because that's also cool um yeah. so uh so yeah so go check that out and speaking of cool things uh and cool people uh brandon where can people check out your cool things uh you can check out everything you want to see about swordsfall on the official site swordsfall.com it's pretty sweet uh, if you want to see behind the scenes artwork and whatnot, we're on Patreon, patreon.com slash swordsfall. Um, if you like spicy rants as well as other stuff on swordsfall, check me out on Twitter at swordsfall1. And uh, soon you can check out my newest game that I'll be helping out. It's called uh, Poisonous Potatoes. <laughs> yes. Legends of the Sinister Spuds. Yes. Yes. If if nothing else comes of this panel, please check that out um, because that is amazing. So thank you all so much for watching. Really appreciate it. Coming up next, uh, Call of Cthulhu is going to be played with Jackson Heenan, David Naylor, Rachel Chi, uh, James Colquillot, and Luke Engel. So go check that out uh, as well. Stick around and chat for that because uh, it's coming up right after this. Uh, to the panelists, thank you so much. To Roll20, thank you so much. I'm James Intracasso. Uh, you can find me at don'tsplitthepodcastnetwork.com where I do a bunch of podcasts similar to of what we did here uh, and I'm also at worldbuilderblog.com and twitter.com slash James and uh, so thank you all so much and uh, stick around for some Call of Cthulhu bye everybody